and welcome to CRISPR Office Hours. Thanks for joining us today. We host CRISPR Office Hours weekly to help the genome engineering community navigate these unique and challenging times. So a few housekeeping measures as we're getting started today. We will have this recorded and placed on YouTube and we have previous office hours also recorded and placed on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Synthigo. You can view all the past guests, um, view all the past recordings. The next step is if you have any questions, please use your chat window. Our goal is to make this as interactive as possible, make sure we have the most amount of engagement so that way we can all benefit from this together and get the information we need and get our questions answered. So please don't hesitate to post your questions in the chat window. The reason we started CRISPR office hours and what we've seen to be a resounding success with our audiences is because we wanted to create a place where the community of genome engineers, researchers, scientists, and other life science professionals can actually ask questions, interact with guests, and understand how various folks are tackling the challenges that are presented to them during this pandemic. Thus, as mentioned previously, the more interaction, the better for everybody involved. With that, I want to introduce myself. My name is Aditya Vempati, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Synthigo. And as always, I'm excited to have my co-host, Kevin Holden, presenting with me. All right. Um, thanks, Aditya. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, another exciting episode of CRISPR Office Hours. So I'm your co-host, Kevin Holden. I'm the head of science at Synthigo. Um, and so the title for our episode this week is uh, the first FDA authorized use of CRISPR for COVID-19 diagnostics. And next up, uh, stop COVID. All right, so um, as we've mentioned a few times in the last few weeks, uh, now has never been a better time to keep calm and carry on. And uh, like we've uh, uh, talked about several times already, uh, this was a poster that was developed by the British government during World War II to assure the public that um, even in the face of danger, it's important not to be paralyzed by fear but to stay calm and collected and, and just get things done. And so we think this slogan is, uh, has never been more appropriate uh, than now. And um, you know, from all of us at Synthigo, we'd like to remind all of you, our genome engineer community, uh, to keep calm and CRISPR on. So Dithya, you wanna tell the audience how they can get one of these cool t-shirts? Yeah, that's right. So. Our goal is to obviously create a community, make sure people are included for genome engineers and other life science professionals. And one of the ways in this pandemic is we created this shirt, Keep Calm and CRISPR On. As we go through the office hours at the very end, there'll be a call to action on how you can get, get the shirt delivered to you. So with that, let's meet today's panel. So as always, my guest, Kevin Holden, but today we're excited to have Omar Abudaya and Jonathan Gutenberg again on the show. They were actually on season one. And Jonathan Gutenberg and Omar Abudaya are both McGovern Fellows and new PIs at MAT. Jonathan, Omar, it's great to have you on the show and thanks for coming back. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having us. So as always, Jonathan you're from, and Omar, you're familiar with that. Uh, we like to have a little poll question. So for you in the audience, uh, who are new to this or have been here before, you know the poll question, we like to have like an icebreaker and have a few options. And you can just enter the number and which option you uh, relate to and we'll ask Kevin, Jonathan and Omar what they think. Our poll question today is, if you could bring one thing from the office or lab to your home, what would it be? First choice, coffee machine. Second, work bestie slash husband slash wife. My comfy chair slash beanbag. My widescreen monitor free snacks, my trusty micro pipettes, the whole lab bench. So we're definitely seeing the answers come in. Um, what would you want to bring from the uh, lab to the home, Jonathan and Omar? Which one would it be for you guys? That's a tough one because, I mean, we do come to lab, so we're not getting separation anxiety from our pipettes. But um, for me, probably uh, the coffee machine because, I mean, although we have it here, um, it would be nice to be able to drink it you know, constantly so we can accomplish our goal of replacing our blood with caffeine. What about you, Omar? Uh, I'd have to go with work husband, uh, which I guess would be Jonathan. It's definitely <laughs> difficult either easier while working. We just became a family unit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, what do you got? Um, I'm gonna actually have to go with my comfortable chair. Um, 
in, in the office of Synthigo. And really, there's actually no excuse for that because Synthigo, it turns out, has a policy where if you want to take your, your chair home, they'll actually even deliver it to you. Um, so that's great. But um, I just haven't gotten around to doing it. I'm not really sure where it's going to fit um, in my apartment. But yeah, the chairs uh, at Synthigo in the office are fantastic. And they're um, my favorite thing about them is that they're um, the bottom of it is kind of, of the chair where you sit is actually kind of like a mesh thing. So it like keeps you cool uh, during the day. Um, so, you know, just ergonomically speaking, I miss my chair. Oh, man. For me, it would have to be the, the work bestie slash uh, work husband, along with the uh, comfy chair like yourself, Kevin. Uh, we're seeing a lot of answers. A unique one is from Lynn Haley, six, which is the uh, trustee of MicroPipettes, but she would also, or he would also like the hood and incubator along with she. it. <laughs> so, all right. And uh, with that, thank you for everyone participating. And Kevin, uh, do you want to take a moment to guide us through the model that we've been following uh, since this uh, pandemic started? Uh, yeah, sure thing. So for the past few weeks, we've been discussing this model developed by the Linus Group, which surveyed over 2,000 scientists about their thoughts and activities during the pandemic. And so some of us, depending on where you are in the world, uh, we're probably now in this kind of transition phase. We're heading into kind of like this new normal. Uh, so last week we heard from uh, Kiana Aron, who's a professor at the Keck Graduate Institute in, in near Los Angeles, uh, and also CSO at CardioBio, um, about how she's trying to develop a diagnostic platform for COVID-19 and other respiratory infections using the CRISPR chip transistor technology she developed. So you can check that out on, on YouTube if you want, uh, the recording of uh, last week. But today we bring back Jonathan Omar from MIT, who have been uh, working with Feng Zhang and others at, at MIT in the Broad in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, to develop CRISPR-based COVID diagnostics on their Sherlock platform. And so since they've, since they've been here last time, their first diagnostic test has been given uh, authorization by the FDA, and they've also just happened to develop a second generation diagnostic called Stop COVID. So um, yeah, okay, so uh, let's move on. Uh, thanks, guys, uh, again, for coming back onto the show. And I know you've got some pretty exciting news and developments uh, to share with us. So we appreciate you joining us on Office Hours to tell us about it. Um, so maybe just to start off with, maybe if you guys can remind our audience about the Sherlock technology platform that you developed as uh, PhD students under Feng Zhang. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I mean, yeah, as many of you might know, we were PhD students with Feng at the Broad and spent many years trying to sort of discover more CRISPR enzymes beyond Cas9 and utilize them for various applications like diagnostics. And so um, as this slide shows, uh, Sherlock was our first kind of use case of combining uh, initial amplification reaction with a CRISPR detection reaction. So we looked at a lot of isothermal amplification methods that could rapidly take, you know, even an individual DNA and RNA molecule and turn it into a lot of DNA that then CRISPR detection could also then detect and further amplify the signal um, using collateral activity. Um, and what's nice about the CRISPR detection is not only does it amplify the signal further, but it also adds an extra layer of specificity, um, which is great for a lot of uh, isothermal amplification technologies that end up being very dirty uh, due to the, the uh, nature of a constant temperature uh, amplification method where you don't get the thermocycling and the extra specificity you get from uh, PCR reactions. And so uh, when we initially combined these two steps, we had a two-step Sherlock version. We did the pre-amplification separate from the CRISPR detection. And it was pretty sensitive. We could get down to single molecule detection. Um, we even developed lateral flow readouts and um, ways to you know, use this almost instrument-free. Instrument uh, but when we you know, started going through the COVID uh, you know, pandemic and realizing that what was really needed uh, was uh, something a little bit easier to use, uh, we started thinking about how do we simplify this away from uh, sort of uh, two steps to a single step. And a lot of what we'll talk about today is where does this original Sherlock technology um, fit in the landscape of testing and where are we trying to go with stop COVID and more uh, portable versions of, of the technology. So, yeah. Oh, and then next slide. So um, one thing that recently happened, it actually, this came out on Omar's birthday, um, <laughs> little fun fact, um, is that uh, the Sherlock Biosciences got an EUA for their COVID-19 test. Um, and so it's kind of insane that something that we were working on in the lab, like, you know, three, four years ago has been 
authorized by the FDA to actually be used on patients. Um, and I think it's a big testament to the power of this whole field of CRISPR diagnostics. Um, and it's also a testament to the amazing team at Sherlock Bio. Um, their CEO, CEO, Rahul Danda, is you know leading an amazing group of people who are really pushing this forward. So that's um, pretty nice to see. Um, and uh, we're hopefully this will start to be deployed uh, soon and we'll actually see the first use of CRISPR on patients either as a therapeutic or a diagnostic. Um, so yeah, we live in a really uh, strange and in some ways exciting times, but it's kind of a testament to how quickly we're all trying to push this to really address this huge problem. Can you guys, um, so yeah, I know you guys, the, the first test that we're talking about here, the, the one that got the FDA authorization, um, you guys actually started working on that back in, in January um, uh, of this year. Can you talk a little bit about like who actually was involved in helping to really develop this and, and provide for it? Yeah, so, so this test is based on a combination of an, a pre-amplification called LAMP and a CRISPR detection. And so during kind of the debugging of those different aspects of it, you have to screen a lot of LAMP primers, um, which is important in developing. And of course, you have to screen a lot of guide RNAs. Um, so this is based on CAS 13A. Um, so it's important to, when you're developing these tests, go through many different design cycles. And so it's nice to be, have uh, RNA providers, you know, I, I know one of them, Synego. No, so Synego has helped a lot with um, uh, deploying tests like these. And um, we'll also be talking about the Stop COVID test today, which uses a, a different CRISPR enzyme and therefore a different guide architecture. Um, it's a little longer and also, you know, Kevin and, and the whole Synego team have been really helpful with uh, providing those really rapidly. So yeah, I think that whenever you're kind of exploring these new modalities, um, it's important to be able to move quickly and have high quality guides. And so that's one thing that you know, Synego has really helped with. Cool, so um, what inspired you guys to uh, develop the next generation of tests as, as we, as I think you can move on to the next slide. Yeah, so um, as we mentioned, the uh, so Sherlock Biosciences test that's UA authorized now um, was really based on sort of the IP uh, and technologies we invented a few years ago, and that's that's a two-step chemistry version that you know is is most amenable for some sort of like plate reader, you know, complex lab setting where there's fl uh, fluidic handling steps that someone trained has to do. Um, so we, you know, went back to the drawing board and we're thinking, well, how do we shrink the chemistry into a single reaction? Um, which is step three here, and make that as easy to use as possible. And then also think about the upstream steps. So like, how do we simplify the extraction and the sample taking so that it's a, as easy as possible just to take a sample from someone and put it into that reaction. And so what we ended up doing, um, you know, as a collaboration uh, between our labs at MIT and Fung's lab at the Broad is we developed this Stop COVID. And the real key is, uh, is a new CRISPR enzyme that uh, is really stable at hotter temperatures so that you can just spike it into the pre-amplification reaction that occurs at 60 degrees. And that basically allows us to create a formulation that uh, works really well together and can just be incubated at 60 degrees for 60 minutes if reading out by lateral flow. And it's actually 20 to 30 minutes if you're doing a fluorescence detection um, and so, and what we did with the sample extraction is we were able to simplify that such that you could take a saliva or nasal swab from someone and you just put it in our uh, sort of special buffer and let it sit for a few minutes. And then you can take that using a simple transfer pipette into the Sherlock uh, stop COVID uh, reaction. Um, and then after incubating that on like a heater, we even show you can use a water bath, like a sous vide uh, machine you would have in your kitchen. Um, you can heat the reaction and then you can just dip a strip into that reaction at the end and get a readout. Um, we also, of course, are thinking about fluorescence readers because that's going to be faster. And so we're looking at how can we develop um, device, a simple device that's really cheap um, that could be used for at-home testing to do a fluorescent readout that would give you a 20 to 30 minute uh, detection window. So, um, Yes, this is, uh, this is really transformative, right? Because you actually don't need to have a lot of lab equipment to do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's was really the goal, and it's, it's actually really amazing now because like it, it was a lot of steps before to run Sherlock even in our own hands, and this is so simple now that it's just it's like a lot of fun to just even run it. <laughs> um, we've been playing around with these even like fixed volume pipettes, so you don't need like precision pipettes that are expensive and you have to be trained to use, but literally like these fixed volume pipettes that are just like droppers. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really great, and I mean, part of 
part of, uh, like I said, part of the, the components that make this really special are the uh, CRISPR enzyme that can operate at a hotter temperature. And what's cool about that is it's from a bacteria that's in like acidic juices, like orange juice or um, fruit juice. And so it's kind of cool that we can really explore novel enzymes and bacteria that are from random places um, to really improve a technology like this and make it as simple as possible. Um, yeah. So I think if you, uh, on the next slide, um, you show the kind of differences, right, between um, the, the, the different tests that, are, that have come out um, that are CRISPR-based, the diagnostics. Um, yeah, so you mentioned um, the Cas12 that you've, you've used, and you, you said, you know, you could find it in uh, uh, citric uh, juices and things like this. How did you um, identify that Cas12? Like where, did, like, where was it identified originally, and what made you think about using it? Yeah, so this is a Cas12B, and we're going to go a little bit into the kind of inside baseball of CRISPR enzyme. So it's a Cas12B, which means it's in the Cas12 family. It targets the DNA, um, but it's a little different than, you know, some of the other enzymes, other groups work, which are commonly Cas12As for collateral detection. And it's from an organism called Acylicyclobacillus acidophilus. Um, so as Omar mentioned, it grows in, in like kind of orange juices and such. Um, we picked it out of a paper that initially characterized it for genome editing um, because it was a genome editing uh, kind of, they, they could get it as a construct to actually make indels and, and cut DNA in mammalian cells, um, which is one thing that castrol bees have not historically been great at. Um, and Fung's group also had a paper around the same time about castrol bees for genome editing. But one thing that we not noticed when we were looking at the paper is that it could go really, really hot. So they did a titration, or I should say a curve of temperatures that it was active at, and it looked like it was active up to around 60, 65, 70 degrees in vitro. So we thought this could be very interesting to apply this at hot temperatures because this lamp loop amplicated, um, loop loop amplicated mediated uh, amplification uh, pro procedure that occurs at uh, about 65, 60 degrees. So by combining these together, we can do this one pot. Um, and a little more of kind of interesting inside story is that the initial kind of RNA scaffold that was um, proposed as being able to be used with the Castro V from AAP um, was actually not the best one we found. So we actually uh, iterated and optimized the scaffold um, about two times. So that helped a lot. Um, so what that means overall though, is that we can combine it with the lamp in the same reaction um, to basically have one pot. And what one pot is valuable for is that here's kind of some other workflows, kind of two of our previous workflows. Um, well, our previous published workflow which was our Sherlock COVID, which is RPA, the EUA, uh, Sherlock Biosciences uh, test and the Mammoth Biosciences test, which was uh, published in NBT, I think maybe now a month ago. Um, but those all need a, a separate step between the application and the detection. So, and that is one, an extra thing that someone has to do. But uh, also it's an opportunity to, when you open the tube, you can release a bunch of amplicon out. And that amplicon is really bad because it can create false positives. So you have to be very careful with controlling the amplicon and we don't have to do that fluid handling step um, and that also reduces the time so you can see that we're around like you know on the order if we do fluorescence um, 25 to 30 minutes of time um, we're shooting for so it really makes it uh, a much more uh, accessible workflow um, and that's really speaks to the power of you know keep keep mining into these different CRISPR enzymes um, and when you do lateral flow, of course, you do have to open the tube to stick something in. But uh, we have a slide later on showing that how you can actually avoid contaminating everything when you do that. Cool. So just to um, just to remind everybody, so the, um, for the uh, the first two up there, you're actually taking um, RNA the, that's present in a uh, patient sample, like um, nasal swab, uh, purifying it, right? Um, and then doing this RT and then this one in one step, you're actually, you're getting the RNA from the sample doing the, the RT um, and then also do the, the CRISPR identification cutting and then um, uh, fluorescence activity are uh, it literally like all in one step, right? Yeah, it's just a unified workflow. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, so uh, this is, I guess, some of the fluorescence data that we have uh, for sort of the stop COVID assay. And uh, 
what's nice about this slide is it shows the difference between just using LAMP alone and then the stop COVID, which is the LAMP plus uh, the CAS-12 detection. And so uh, what this shows is you can get, uh, if you do real-time fluorescence with LAMP, you can get detection, but you also get a lot of background curves that come up and you can see some of the lower concentrations and even the NTC curve coming up, which is not ideal. Um, and so what's really great about CRISPR detection is you only, with the CAS enzyme, you only generate fluorescence with the specific sequence that the CAS enzyme is recognizing through the guide. And that causes all the background detection to go down, really improving the specificity of the assay. Um, here you can also see that by fluorescence or assay really can be as quick as 20 minutes. You see the curves coming up and they reach saturation at about like 25 minutes, I would say. So that's why we say by fluorescence with a five minute sample extraction step and then 25 minute fluorescence readout, you could basically have a 30 minute overall test. And that's why we really want to port that onto a simple head health fluorescence device. Uh, yeah, next slide. Yeah, so we, of course, were very lucky to be ha able to have access to different uh, patient samples through collaborators um, at Yale and University of Washington. So what we have been able to do is actually take uh, nasopharyngeal swabs from patients and test them. So here we have basically uh, 12 patients that we tested in triplicate, and we got essentially 35 out of 36 um, called uh, correctly. So that's 97% sensitivity. And one thing that you can note is that uh, the CT of the one that we had inconsistent calls on was uh, quite high, which means that there's very low viral load. And we're exploring ways that we can essentially uh, e even further improve sensitivity by optimizations on the chemistry and different aspects of uh, buffers and purification. So we can uh, hit these as well. Um, one of the things that we can also spike into saliva and test that, and we're exploring saliva, as well as other types of swabs that would be much more accessible. So I, I don't know if anybody on the um, call or, or, or here has been tested. Um, I thankfully had not had to be tested, but apparently it's quite uh, unpleasant to have an NP swab taken because they basically feel like they're jabbing your brain with a swab. Um, but uh, so we're exploring compatibility with different ways that someone could even actually um, administer the test themselves um, in an unskilled manner. So the chemistry is very generalizable across uh, different types. So, um, well, there was another question I saw that came through um, in the chat and Omar, I know you're hammering away and answering questions there, so thank you. But um, <laughs> some, somebody, somebody had asked about, um, can you use the test in, for wastewater? Have you guys looked at that at all? So we um, are lucky enough to kind of be in the community with uh, Eric Alm, who yeah. does a lot of different uh, testing of wastewater and tracking for COVID. And so we have been kind of interacting with them on using the test for that. Um, so basically, I don't see why not. There's questions on how much wastewater uh, is, or how much virion is present in wastewater without purification. Because, you know, if you have to purify a liter of wastewater down to 100 microliters to get any sort of signal, then we can't do that without purification. Um, but if that levels are high enough, then you can probably go without this, with, with using our crude kind of purification and then following readout. Otherwise, you can also, of course, purify it and concentrate it down to a level that we can detect to where you know it's above the threshold of if you put anything in you'll get virion um and that should work as well so we're exploring that but we're also open to people getting the test and testing it on wastewater um for research use only purposes um and there's a slide at the end on our website where you can go to request kits so um yeah it's very generalizable um and it's a it's a great chemistry uh, maybe move on to the next yep. slide. There you go. Yep. Uh, so I think there's a build here. Yeah. So this is basically um, just the quantitation of that that previous slide, where you can see, you know, basically we're getting this 97% uh, uh, detection. Yeah. So next slide. <clears throat> yeah. So. Uh... This slide kind of shows our uh, sort of vision for how we want this to be used um, in kind of point of care settings. And so um, here it's just showing that you can basically take an incubated cube and put it into a device that basically crushes the tube and loads onto a lateral flow strip. And then you have a mobile app that can read the lateral flow strip. And um, this is something we've been working on. And, um, you know, there's U-star cartridges that kind of exist for this purpose already. What's really great about this is, you know, you want to limit opening tubes of amplified material because once you spread amplified material in the setting, you'll start getting false positives in the future. And so having a device like this that contains the reaction and then just runs out in the strip is really great. Um, and there's also, I think, just kind of uh, 
we use this slide as kind of an outlook, you know, thinking about what kind of devices can we run the reaction on and, you know, we're trying to think about what will the final form factor be uh, for release for like a point of care test. And that's kind of where we're thinking about now and moving towards. So I have a question. Uh, who can currently access the test and what are what steps are being taken to make it widely available? So for Stop COVID, uh, right now kits can be requested on stopcovid.science for research development use uh, to help us with making it better and running it on patient samples. We can also work with organizations that want to deploy it uh, in lab settings and they can work to collaborate with us um, and other folks to maybe get either EUA or use it on, on their uh, populations. Um, and then in terms of something more generalizable, we are trying to make, like we said, an all-in-one, easy to use disposable device. Um, and that's kind of a longer outlook because we just have to make the device and scale it. Um, and we're hoping maybe end of the year, that's something we can uh, get going. Um, you know, for Sherlock Biosciences, the lab-based tests, right, they have the EUA, anyone can order those. Um, and I really encourage you to get in touch with the company um, if you want to run the lab-based version, um, like in a CLIA lab. Um, but yeah, for Stop COVID, um, there's, uh, yeah, there's still more work to be done to make it truly at home or point of care. Yeah. And that's what we're working on. Yeah. So, so that's the so eventual yeah. goal. Yeah. The eventual goal is, yeah, having things that can be run. I mean, if you think about how testing is done right now, it's very, you know, intermittent because we can't meet the testing needs to test like every day. But if you did test every day, you could actually have people return to workplaces and screen rather than having like a kind of post hoc diagnosis or test. And that could really change how we do the, these test trace isolate procedures um, and allow us to drastically change how we manage the spread of the disease. So once we hit that inflection point, it'll, it'll you know, even in the absence of a vaccine or other small molecules or antibodies that can address the disease, it pro provides us a very powerful tool to help deal with the epidemic. So uh, yeah, just to add on to that, um, uh, you guys said, you know, you can get these tests available from, from Sherlock or you can actually visit here um, the, the Stop COVID uh, website. Um, and just shameless plug, if, you, if anyone out there is trying to uh, uh, utilize one of these tests and uh, Syntego can make the RNA molecules for you, like we uh, also made for, the, for these tests. So um, feel free to reach out to us um, if you're interested in getting some of that material. Um, but can you guys tell us about the uh, the website here a little bit? Yeah. So if you go to stopcovid.science, um, you can, of course, read the white paper um, that, and we're actually constantly updating it. So we're, of course, trying to work on improving the chemistry and that'll be pushed. You can even go down and, and sign up. Um, and you can, whenever we update the uh, white paper, we'll email out. Um, you can also read, of course, about our approach and you know, the different aspects of the chemistry and, and what's there. Um, and then kind of most interestingly, uh, you can see the live data. So we're getting some data from collaborators now, and we're going to be posting that um, kind of on the live data uh, stream so you can see how it compares. And as Omar mentioned, uh, we, you can request a research use only kit to actually test um, on samples that you have yourself um, for research purposes or to play around with the kit, you know, try different types of extraction methods, try different additives, try different types of, you know, devices that you may want. Um, you know, I think that one thing that we really want to see is that this forms a basis for additional innovations. Um, and it'd be great, you know, if you find something amazing, you can share it back with us or with the community. So it's really trying to go towards this collaborative effort where, you know, anyone who can do this research um, can take part and be involved. Great. Um, and, you know, I, I think another thing that's really important um, that maybe we didn't touch on so much is um, given like, you know, how literally you can go from a patient sample directly into the test um, and, you know, uh, maybe you don't need to do any uh, RNA isolation. Um, you know, if people are thinking about setting one of these tests up in, in maybe some parts of the world right now where it's actually difficult to get reagents or access the lab equipment. Um, you know, I think that really speaks to how transformative a test like this can be. Yeah, I mean, it's really important to be able to have things that are accessible, you know, both in the US and globally, because the resource limits are, are pretty variable. Um, yeah, okay, so maybe uh, I know we have some questions from the audience that we wanted to get to, uh, but maybe just uh, before we do that, can you guys just remind us about um, the lab you set up at MIT? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Jonathan and I have been 
sort of running a group now at MIT for more than a year. Um, we have about you know nine people. We've uh, we're not doing diagnostics in our group. Uh, Initially, we were mostly focused on genome engineering, new ways to do really efficient and programmable insertion of large DNA, new delivery modalities, because um, a lot of the tools we developed are large and don't quite fit into AV or other viral vectors. Um, and even a little bit of aging research, applying some of the tools we developed to better study aging and senescence. Um, I think, you know, with sort of the advent of COVID and, you know, having to refocus our efforts, I think we realized you know, we have a really amazing technology and we wanted to do more with it to really address the COVID diagnostic and the problems that it generated with the idea, you know, now people need to test themselves almost daily around the country and we need, you know, tens of millions of tests probably a week. Um, and so we started thinking about, you know, how can we really build on our technology to address this new problem and this new need. So now our group is also working heavily on sort of, yeah, point of care diagnostics, device development. Um, and that's been a lot of fun as well. Um, and if you know anyone is interested in uh, working with us, we actually are looking for a lot of help with the Stop COVID effort, um, as well as other projects on, on the other side of COVID. So I, I encourage people to reach out to us. Um, we have a lot of funding now to, for these things. So it would be great to work with talented and fun people. Yeah. So. And of course, this is a collaboration with Fung. So we'd like to thank you know Fung for having a great environment and allowing us to you know, work with him once again. He's always a, a joy to work with. And many members of his lab, including um, Julia, Alim, and Makoto. Um, you may have seen John Gladha, those are the two co-first authors of the paper. Um, and our many collaborators who have been um, gracious enough to provide us with sample and insight um, into the clinical side of things, um, from the Reagan Institute here, University of Washington, um, Yale, and beyond. And you know, hopefully any of you who are interested. So. Um, yeah, it's been uh, a really uh, <laughs> a sprint to help get this out, but um, it's definitely not over yet. So um, we're just looking to collaborate as widely as we can. So we have questions from the audience. Um, let's get to the first one. Kevin, you want to kick it off here? Yeah, so we, these are questions that were submitted when people uh, registered. So uh, some of them may have been answered in the chat. So apologies if they're redundant, but uh, Tanme, who's at the uh, uh, the Cancer Research UK, Kruk, in Cambridge, has asked, are there protocols for Cas12b protein production um, for using Stop COVID? And also, is it possible to get the lateral flow units um, and are devices being made? It looks, I know you talked about the devices, but maybe you can touch on that. Yeah, so for Cas12b protein production, um, Agene is, I think it's going through QC right now, um, the plasma for that, so you can, if you have the capacity for protein production, so fermenters or incubators and you know, a microfluidizer or a sonicator, you can purify the protein yourself. Um, the protocol is very similar to our, we have a Nature Protocols paper on um, how to purify the Cas13A protein for Sherlock. And it generally follows that, follows that same protocol. If you um, aren't lucky enough to have the capability to purify protein, um, NEB or New England Biolabs um, is working on uh, getting speeding up production. So that should hopefully uh, be QC'd soon. Um, so uh, that's another alternative. Um, and then for other aspects of the kit, so we have a quick extract buffer. Um, we have a, a letter flow strips um, and that U-Star device. Um, so the U-Star device, uh, we're actually testing it now. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that works. And um, I can't speak to availability for that, but definitely the, the buffer and strips that are used in the paper, uh, the white paper, those are available from the providers there. So you can get uh, those quite easily. Um, and we're looking forward, um, of course, to having even these simpler devices, although that's a, a longer process as well. Um, all right, so I think we have another question. We can ask people not to, to whiteboard on here. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, the uh, question, we have a question from Kubra at GTU Turkey. What led you to change the cast protein type in the method from stop COVID from the first test you developed? Uh, so, yeah, so the issue, so the issue with a lot of these preamplification methods, they operate at different temperatures, right? And so you have to find a CRISPR enzyme that operates at the temperature that your isothermal operates at. So. Our original Sherlock method was RPA was the preamplification, and that was at 37 degrees. Uh, now that 
is that was great for our original enzyme Cas13 because that was also optimal at 37 degrees. But it was hard to combine the RPA and the Cas13 and the you know RT enzyme for taking the RNA into DNA and the T7 polymerase onto one reaction. It didn't work super well, and we found the RPA to be hard to scale and manufacture as well. So we were think you know we realized to make a single step one pot reaction, we had to switch to preamplification. So we eventually ended up on LAMP, which is really great. Um, easier to set up, simpler components, but LAMP is best at hot temperatures, like in the 60s, like 65, 70 degrees. And so to do that, we really had to find more thermophilic cast proteins. Now, there aren't that many, um, so we had to really, you know, look hard and screen enzymes for activity, and we eventually found one um, that was great in the 60s. This is the one from the fruit juice, AP. There was another paper and there, uh, that had used one, an enzyme called AAC, Cas12B, that we previously characterized back in 2015. Um, but that kind of started dying in the mid-50 degree range. And so we found it didn't work as well. Um, but this new enzyme, we could really run it at 60 degrees. And that was kind of the key to getting stop COVID to work as a single you know, pot reaction. So, yeah. All right, oh. so, uh, I think we have another question. Can we move on to the next one? Yeah. So uh, what's the advantage and disadvantage of CRISPR-based diagnostics compared to other diagnostics? I think we kind of hit on that a little bit. Yeah, just to I recap think CRISPR-based diagnostics compared to cold tuner qPCR, um, of course, it's amazing to have these methods that are, are sensitive, these molecular tests um, like qPCR, but I think the requirement for infrastructure and certain consumables and certain expertise has, as we've seen, created certain gating factors into getting these widely disseminated and, and tested. So I think these alternative CRISPR-based diagnostics and, and other like more rapid diagnostics are, are really needed right now. Cool. Okay, um, next one. Um, and we, again, like to ask people to stop whiteboarding, please, on the screen. Uh, now that one of the diagnostic tests has the authorization, how soon realistically can the tools be distributed on a mass scale to hospitals, institutions, and, and maybe homes? And maybe a follow on to that is like, how are you thinking about uh, trying to commercialize the stop COVID? Yeah. Um, so I think for stop COVID, we really wanted to be point of care and at home uh, sort of amenable. And so to do that, it's really a, uh, thinking about the device that it would go on and how quickly can the device be scaled. Um, and right now, I think we're thinking a timeline of hopefully end of year um, but, you know, we'll continue to post updates on stopcovid.science and we hopefully, you know, we hope to engage the community as well as we make progress. So we'll definitely be open about that. Great. So Kevin, uh, do you want to take us back to the model which we've been going through here? Uh, yeah, you know, just to kind of uh, reiterate, uh, we're kind of going through this, uh, in this transition phase right now and into the new normal. Maybe what that new normal looks like is that we'll be able to access um, you know, uh, very uh, rapid um, and uh, easy to use um, transformative diagnostic testing. Uh, so, you know, people can actually be tested uh, more regularly and maybe that will help us to isolate people who are infected rather than just everybody isolating. I think that's really gonna uh, allow things to open up more rapidly and, and people have like, you know, uh, more peace of mind and it can just be a, a safer environment for everybody and for the economy uh, to really move uh, forward, so. Um, okay, let's uh, let's go on. Cool. So we actually have guests uh, coming up in the next week. Do you want to mention uh, in the next two weeks, or do you want to mention we'll be on? Uh, yeah. So um, actually, um, we're taking next week off, um, and so in uh, two weeks, we're going to be joined by um, Nevin Krogan. So that'll be on June fourth. Uh, so Nevin Krogan is a professor and also uh, the director of the Quantitative Biosciences Institute at uh, UCSF in San Francisco. Um, he's going to be joining us along with Jacqueline Fabius, who's the chief operating officer there. And so um, they actually have recently put out a paper in Nature um, that uh, basically shows, uh, gives a map of all the proteins that interact with SARS-CoV-2. So it's kind of known as the virus interactome. And so Synthigo has actually been collaborating uh, with Nevin and his team. So uh, we wanted to bring Nevin on and talk about that research effort. Um, it's a multi-national um, uh, collaboration with over 120 scientists involved, um, really with the goal of uh, trying to identify potential therapeutic targets uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2. So it'd be great to have him on. So again, next week, um, we're, we're not going to be here. Uh, we're taking the week off. I know it's a holiday in the U.S., also in the U.K. on Monday, so we have a short week. 
Um, and then we'll be back in two weeks uh, to talk to, uh, to Nevin Krogan. Kevin, you have to ask Nevin where he buys his suits. I know Nevin has like the coolest shirts, like, <laughs> um, yeah. and uh, if any, any Canadians in the audience, you always notice he usually has a little uh, maple leaf pin on as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So I was going to ask him about how he destroyed us in the game of Euchre at the last CRISPR conference. We had a little competition. <laughs> yeah. He's insane at card games. He's very savage. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one question for both of you guys before we hop off here. What are you going to have for lunch? <laughs> So we were trying to get Wendy's, but we were eating not the lure. So if anyone can uh, provide inspiration in the chat, we'll uh, definitely take that, take that into consideration. And for season three of CRISPR Office Hours, we can let you guys know what we ordered. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, we want to finish off here and uh, let you know you can go to Synthigo.com to Synthigo.com slash com to claim your shirt. And thank you again, Jonathan and Omar, for being on CRISPR office hours. I know it's the second time here, but it's always a pleasure. Really enjoyed it. And thank you to my amazing co-host who always gets to the root of the uh, questions and makes this office hours very interactive experience. Thank you for having me having being right. on here, guys. All right. Yeah. Jonathan and Omar, thank you guys again so much for coming by. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and it's, it's been fantastic to work with you, um, with you guys and, you know, getting uh, reagents for the, for the kits. Um, so, you know, hopefully uh, everything moves forward very smoothly and, you know, wish you both the best of luck uh, getting this out more often. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. It's always a pleasure. Thanks guys. All right. Thank you everyone. Okay, thank you everybody. Right. Goodbye. Bye.